Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and this episode is TTS Thursday number 6. Today's topic is on group training. We'll discuss the pros, the cons and how to do it right. But before that, a big thanks to our sponsors, Zen8. Zen8 creates a swim trainer that uh, helps time crunch athletes get more consistency in their swim training when you don't have enough time to get to the pool or when pools are closed. It also allows you to, in a really controlled environment, work on your technical skills by working on the high elbow catch because the swim bench is designed to be just the right height for that and to work on your core activation because the swim bench has an instability element to it that forces you to activate your core as you go through the, the swim stroke. Uh, the bench is a massive improvement on traditional stretch cord exercises because it allows you to perform your swim stroke in a horizontal prone position rather than standing up and putting a lot of stretch through your hamstrings and posterior chain. It is simply much, much more specific. You can get 20% off your order of the Zen8 Swim Trainer by going to zen8swimtrainer.com forward slash TTS and use the discount code there. And thank you to Roka. Roka are the world leading manufacturers of wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, and high performance eyewear and prescription glasses and sunglasses. Whether you're looking to go faster in the open water, get more performance and aerodynamics out of your tri suit, or find the perfect pair of eyeglasses combining function, comfort, and design, Roka have an option for you. Uh, their products are all based on exceptional R&D and attention to every single detail, whether it comes it comes down to performance or comfort or whatever it may be, depending on the product line. But they are really amazing products and you can get them for 20% off with the promo code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. I'd also like to ask that if you are enjoying the podcast, uh, please remember to rate and review it on your podcast platform of choice. Uh, It really is important in helping other listeners find the podcast and that keeps it going and keeps it sustainable. Now let's move on to today's topic, which is group training. Obviously, uh, this is uh, a bit of a an interesting situation, an interesting timing for a group training episode, given that we're still uh, in the middle of an, an ongoing pandemic and that limits the opportunities we have to train with others, at least for many of us. But hopefully, relatively soon, this will start to change. And uh, just in anticipation of that and uh, with an optimistic outlook, I wanted to discuss this topic, which I think is very important and an underutilized tool in the toolbox of many triathletes. When we talk about group training, by the way, throughout this episode, I I will be using that term, mostly group training, but uh, really I'm using that interchangeably for even just training together with one single training partner or a few training partners. It doesn't have to be mean formal group training and it doesn't have to mean that you have to be multiples or more than two Two people can also be a group in this context. So I just wanted to make that clear from the start. Now, what we'll talk about in this episode, just to give you a little bit of an outline, we'll start by talking about options and the different contexts in which we're doing group training in triathlon and in endurance sports in general. Then we'll move on to the pros and cons, or rather the pros and the challenges of group training. Then we'll discuss briefly the scientific evidence uh, of group training. And uh, finally, we'll talk about how to strategically use group training to maximize its benefits for you and for your performance improvements. So that's four parts uh, by and large. And we'll start with options and contexts for group training in triathlon and in endurance sports. So Let's just uh, quickly list a number of options in which we are training together. Uh, we can have a swim squad. is a very typical thing that many triathletes and, of course, swimmers do. And uh, that is usually led by a coach. It can be a swim-specific swim squad or it can be a triathlon-specific swim squad. There are many options around, uh, at least in normal times. Uh, but that is a very typical example. We also have the standard group ride. So... Those can be more or less formal, and uh, some of them are are very big, and some of them are smaller. There are they they come in all sorts and shapes, really. But typically, it would be a weekend group ride, 
gathering on a Saturday or Sunday morning and going out for a couple of hours, three hours maybe, and uh, and they might be more or less controlled in their, or structured. There might be there might be some uh, some hill climbs or like races up hills. There might be a finishing sprint, uh, first one to the lamppost and so on. And so again, many different shapes and sizes, but group rides is uh, a staple for many endurance athletes uh, when it comes to training in groups. Then we have group run workouts, and the typical example of this would be a track workout. And uh, again, this can quite often be led by by a coach, whether it's a, a running club coach or a triathlon club coach. Uh, so that uh, they set a session and the runners or the athletes go out and execute the session. And this uh, being on a track, of course, allows for different levels, just like in the swim, we have different lanes, slower lanes, faster lanes. And on the track, we can have the slightly slower runners can do something do a little bit less and the fast runners do a little bit more and do it a little bit faster and so on. So that that is another typical example. And then finally, we have just you training together with one or more training partners. So they might, you might tell your buddies in a WhatsApp group or something that, hey, I, I have this ride planned for tomorrow. Do you want to join? And they can join you or the other way around and you join somebody for, for their workouts. Uh, so athletes use any number of ways of combining these different options and probably others that I've missed as well in their training to to work in training together. Uh, and let's look at some basically how these different uh, examples are used or how these different types of group workouts are used in different endurance sports at the top level. So in swimming, we really don't have any options to group training uh, at the top level or at any level, really. Like swimming is essentially a team sport when it comes to the training aspect of it. Every swimmer, swimmer in the world really trains in a, in a squad environment. And that's not to say that there isn't some individualizational training, because of course there is, but, uh, but a lot of the training is done in, as a group and, uh, and done together with others. And then the top swimmers, of course, they have their own, their coach might do, tell them to, okay, for this set, you do something different because you really need to work on this. But uh, but it doesn't stop the fact that a lot of their swimming is done is done together with a group of other swimmers. And running is very similar in that, well, we have the famous examples of Kenyans and Ethiopians. We discussed this quite recently in an interview with Michael Crawley on Ethiopian running. And, but both Kenyans and Ethiopians are very famous for how important the group structure is to their success, the success of, of the runners and the group being stronger than the sum of its parts and helping everybody rise farther than they could without the help of the groups. And that is something that back in the day when American distance running from having been very successful earlier in the 70s, for example, being very, very strong, but then had a very long sort of barren period of very few, if any, medals at world and Olympic level. Uh, some coaches set out to correct by establishing different running groups, looking at, for example, the Kenyan model and realizing that the best runners in the world at that time were all training groups. And they started to emulate that. And this was in the 90s, really, is when this started happening uh, from what I can remember at least right now from reading my running history and we have examples in uh, in Mammoth Lakes in we have the uh, Brooks Hansen's project we have Flagstaff a Flagstaff group we had the Nike Oregon project and the Bowerman Track Club so those are some very famous examples of groups of American runners and they eventually started leading to uh, to runners like Meb Kefleski and Dina Castor bringing home Olympic medals uh, Galen Rupp is another uh, Olympic medalist as well that has come through one of the different American groups. So so American distance running has in the last couple of decades uh, or more than two decades, I think, really started to uh, to evolve and bring on that, vol that, that model of group training being essential to the success even in an individual sport such as running. And uh, of course, a very famous example here in Europe these days is the, uh, the Norwegian Ingebrigtsen brothers, uh, who are amazing and Jakob Ingebrigtsen now especially being one of the favorites for the 1500 meters uh, in Tokyo uh, and even at his age of 19 still I believe or maybe 20 but having had his 
his older brothers uh, as training partners throughout throughout his upbringing as a runner has really be, made an amazing difference difference to him and to them uh, to to all of them really having having the three of them spur each other on motivate each other compete with each other has has made a made a huge difference difference clearly in how successful they have become and cycling in the world of cycling at the top level we of course have training camps at the that the teams organize where all the teammates are riding together but even outside of the these training camps which form a reasonably large part of the season really when the team is together uh, but but outside of that as well most most cyclists being that they train 25 hours per week 30 hours per week even uh, they will train with training partners and they might be teammates living in the same region or they might be not teammates at all they might even be a world tour rider might not have to ride with another world tour rider it might be somebody at a more continental level or even national level because a lot of the riding is relatively low intensity so so very few cyclists if any will go out and do those 25 hours uh, alone and well for one thing very few riders will do a large part of the of their riding on the indoor trainer most of the riding is done outdoors in the at the top level and most of that riding they they will have somebody with them or at least a, a large part of the riding not this well a reasonably big part of the training they will do with a training partner i remember reading chris Froome's autobiography for example and him talking about how how important richie port was to him in uh, not just as a domestique when he started winning the Tour de France, but but just in the day to day training that they were doing every single day in the Monaco region where where they were living, and bringing it home to triathlon in short course triathlon, most top athletes are part of a training group, and these might be national groups or well they could be regional groups but under the national federation, so uh, training groups with elite and aspiring elite athletes training together or it can be things like an international training group for example the joel filial squad uh, and even the norwegian group now is becoming a bit more international with them bringing on some other uh, some athletes from other countries that uh, that can can adapt to that model of training and and want and bring something to the group so so there are different different types of systems there in place but most if not all of the top athletes on the short course scene do train in a training group and in long course there aren't as many formal groups uh, to the same extent as in short course although of course we have some athletes flip-flopping between short and long course the norwegians being an example of that Uh, but most top athletes at long course triathlon uh, seem to still do a fair amount of training with groups or with at least a training partner so we have Jan Frodeno has his swim squad and his uh, loyal training partner Nick Castellane. Uh, Lionel Sanders has his swim squad and running training partners for his hard runs. Uh, Lucy Charles Barclay training with uh, her husband Reese and uh, and vice versa, obviously. And uh, and somebody like Alistair Brownlee basically seemed to have his pick of swim squad brother Johnny and uh, running and cycling with other triathletes but also with runners and cyclists in the yorkshire area so those are just some examples to paint a picture but but even in long course triathlon even though it's a more solitary sport for sure than short course triathlon there is still uh, a good amount of of group training going on there for most of the top pros so let's discuss what the the benefits and potential drawbacks of group training might be starting with the benefits well first of all it is fun to go out and train with others uh, whether it's one person or many uh, it's, it's just fun it's enjoyable it makes us remember why we fell in love with the sport in the first place it adds motivation for, to to push in in the workout if it's a harder workout well it and potentially on the drawback side it can add motivation to push even when you shouldn't push but we'll get to that in a bit but it, it adds motivation even to show up uh, and and do the work and when when you have somebody waiting for you you won't uh, you won't just skip the, the workout like you might do if you uh, if you're doing it on your own and that brings us to the point of accountability and it falls into that motivation having a group or a training partner to train with makes you accountable to both show up and to push hard when when you are required to push hard Uh, also 
it allows you to do way more hard work than you otherwise could. As a personal example, I'm, I swim with a swim squad and we're regularly doing threshold swims, for example, with a 3000 meter main set. And that's just something that I could never even uh, consider doing on my own, to be honest. I could consider it, but I don't think I would do it. But in a group, you, you somehow manage to uh, to pull through something that just seems ridiculous. And, and then you feel very good afterwards and, and it, it becomes a positive feedback loop. Uh, and, uh, and the same goes in any discipline, any type of workout, you can do more. The perception of effort seems to decrease and that allows you to push harder or do more work at that same intensity. A group also is a benefit in that it, it becomes a benchmark for you to track your progress against. For example, are you moving up to, to faster lanes in your swim squad or are you just seeing that you're managing to get closer to the fast, fastest people in the group, in your running group, or you're not getting dropped on the climbs on your group ride anymore? That, that kind of benchmarking can be, first of all, very informational, but, but also just, again, add to the motivation of keeping, keeping training. And uh, the group allows you to learn from others. It provides a great learning environment. You can learn swim technique from the best swimmers in the uh, in the group and by the way i'm not talking about necessarily like having a lecture by, by somebody but just by osmosis and seeing other people and being around other people that do things very well that helps you learn but of course you can also ask people about things so that is it's it, it works both ways in a bike group you can learn about bike handling and equipment and and any whatever group workout you're doing you can learn about strategies and tactics and, and just general endurance sports knowledge soak up some some wisdom from others or just some not necessarily even wisdom but opinions and form multiple perspectives and, and think about different perspectives which is always useful and finally uh, and the final benefit that i'll list here is that you it allows you to teach others as well uh, and again this can happen through osmosis but also through people asking for your advice or uh, or you just offering your advice to them and teaching is also a great way to to basically solidify your knowledge knowledge that you already have and get you to think about things so so those are that's a good big list of benefits of doing group training now in terms of drawbacks or at least drawbacks slash, slash challenges uh, the first one that i have listed here is time commitment and I think this one is probably the biggest hurdle for a lot of us amateur triathletes because our schedules are typically packed. And the thing is that with group workouts, it typically does take you a bit longer to do them than, than it takes to, to do something on your own. Like you can't just run out the door and then have the timing be perfect so that the group runs past you just as you head out the door. Maybe if you do a group workout, you jog to the track and then you wait around for a little bit and the coach talks and there's a bit of a warm-up, uh, an informal warm-up and then a formal warm-up and then you do the work. And, and yeah, you might spend another an extra 30 minutes or so doing basically the same work as you would have done on your own if you had just gone through it in a very streamlined fashion. The same goes for swimming, the same goes for cycling. So, so this is a big hurdle and it's very understandable that it prevents us from doing as much group training as we otherwise, otherwise might like to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it needs to be acknowledged that this is something that, uh, that prevents us from doing group training as much as we would like perhaps. But, but if you can get around that somehow, then there, is, there are big benefits on the other side. Another uh, a challenge is also to find a group or just a training partner that is not necessarily that is of your level, but that works for your level and level of fitness, I mean. So, so a group or a partner that allows you to push hard enough when, when you should be pushing hard, but also is not like too extreme on that side so that you essentially push yourself to overtraining. Uh, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit later on as well with regard to selection of which group workouts to go to. Uh, but but also as well, of course, you don't want to be doing a group workout where the workout is supposedly hard, but you're not working hard because you're far fitter than everybody else in the group. And then there's really no point in that. Then you would be better off doing your own workout if the day is meant to be a hard day, at least. Uh, and then another challenge is to find similar to the form the to the one that I just mentioned is finding a group or a training partner that works 
considering your goals so for example if you're training for an ironman but you're training in a in a group that works on that works towards draft legal short course racing then yes there is a lot of overlap of course between any triathlon or endurance sports discipline but at some point when you get closer to your race especially then you as an ironman athlete probably need to put in those long rides with sustained efforts and if the draft legal group is doing a lot of short criterium style rides then that's not going to be optimal training to set you up optimally for for your goal race so so, so that yeah if you that, that that type of group might not be optimal for that part of the season at least and then either you need to find another training partner or group or you might just choose to go at it alone for for a while of the period but that's not to say that that group cannot be perfectly in line or aligned with your goals and your objectives for other parts of the season so so this can also ebb and flow with the season and depending on where you are compared to your races and the final challenge here is to find the right balance between individually optimized training and benefiting from training with the group and by that i mean it's it's kind of on the same line as the one before when you are training specifically for an ironman you're approaching the race and you need those long rides with sustained efforts that is a pretty clear individual need and to optimize your training you need to have that type of training in one way or the other probably uh not not that's not to say that there's there's not exceptions to that rule but for most people that that would be the case and uh, and how do you then balance that between between be- being able to benefit from doing hard work with the group because if you can work harder you should get fitter and and if you're fitter then you should be able to race harder so so basically it becomes a question of how different can the group's training be from what you would ideally do if you were to design your training exactly as you wanted for it to still be worth it to go and do the training with a group and where is the line where you need to decide that okay i'm just going to do this on my own follow my own training program and maybe find a training partner or find another group to do it with so and and then also of course being able to understand that well maybe i can still do one really hard intense workout per week even if i am training for an ironman with the group and then i do the rest of the training on my own uh, and uh, so there are different uh, different ways different solutions there no right and wrong answer necessarily but finding that right balance is what what can be a bit of a tricky challenge now let's talk a little bit about whether there is any scientific evidence of uh, benefits from group training and the answer is that there is but uh it's not necessarily like it's quite scarce and and it's not very specific to endurance performance we have i will link to a few studies in the show notes but a few that i want to mention here is uh, first one by uh, carol in 2002 which is called cohesion and performance in sport a meta-analysis so i won't by the way i won't go through these studies in any great detail uh, because they are a little bit outside of the scope of this episode but i do want to to show you a little bit of what what evidence exists in the scientific literature but basically this study uh, found 46 studies that included almost 10,000 athletes and more than 1,000 teams and uh, and they wanted to figure out whether there was a relationship between group cohesion and performance in sports and uh, they found that there was a significant moderate to large effect size on uh, the the cohesion performance relationship for for sports teams and sports teams here isn't actually defined in the study so i think it could apply to just regular training groups as well like a swim squad or a track squad uh, because it it doesn't say specifically anywhere that this is about actual team sports it just says sport teams pretty loosely uh, so so that was uh, that was quite a big big meta analysis and uh, cohesion of course is a bit like should we then go out and look for the swim squad that has the best cohesion and team spirit it, that's not necessarily it, it's just one variable is what i'm saying but i think that whenever you go and join a group then you have some sort of cohesion and maybe more cohesion is better but you certainly have more cohesion by training in a group versus you just training on your own so i think that if we extrapolate this study a little bit at least uh, this is kind of just my my thinking out loud 
then it kind of tells us a little bit what we anecdotally know already that training in a group can help you improve performance because uh, just because that uh, if it's a functional and not a dysfunctional group then then you will have that group effect and it's measured in the scientific terms with cohesion which is measured by a group environment questionnaire but that's not something we need to go into but uh, but i think this meta-analysis was really interesting and then the next study i want to mention is called rowers high behavioral synchrony is correlated with elevated pain thresholds by cohen in 2010 and they had 12 male athletes from the university of oxford boat club and they tested the pain threshold and the difference in pain threshold from before to after a training session when the training session was done either individually or as a group workout and this was in a gym on rowing ergometers in both cases the workout consisted of 45 minutes of continuous continuous rowing in the group workouts they did this workout as six people working working out together in a virtual in a virtual boat and they were working in synchrony and the result they found was that group training significantly increased the pain threshold so the difference from uh, pre to post uh, workout was uh, was significantly different different uh, in favor of group training and the authors say that this suggests that synchronized activity somehow heightens opioidergic activity uh, we can rule out the possibility that this effect might have been owing to elevated work rates in the group condition because the rower's power output was not significantly different in the two conditions in either session. We can also rule out any experiential or order confounds because pain tre- thresholds did not differ between the two sessions. Thus, the heightened effect in the group conditions appears to have been owing in some way to the effects of working together as a highly coordinated team. So that is really interesting. And uh, this is something that there is evidence of that working in synchrony, working as a highly coordinated unit, it really elevates that group effect. And that's not necessarily something we always do in a triathlon setting. Uh, but that being said, I think in a swim squad, for example, you're doing 50s, everybody leaving on the same one minute, or you're doing 100s, everybody leaving on the same one minute, 30 seconds, or whatever it might be. You're basically you're still getting some sort of synchrony, even if it's not necessarily everybody has the same stroke rate or uh, or that sort of thing. So there are levels of synchrony, and and I think that you don't need to to t- to take from this study that you have to do something in perfectly synchronized ma- in a perfectly synchronous manner for it to be effective. I don't think that it says that, but even though that's what they tested. I do think that synchrony exists on multiple levels and and there is some synchrony depending on how we think about it even in typical triathlon group workout settings. The final study I want to mention is called Social Bonds and Exercise Evidence for Reciprocal Relationship by Davis in 2015. And they did two different experiments which were really interesting. In the first one they tested the hypothesis that moderately intense synchronous group exercise leads to increased bonding and cooperation among participants in a public goods game i won't talk too much about that because that's uh, definitely beyond the scope of this i just want to briefly mention is that what they did is that they tested taking people and uh, having them do a synchronous exercise i think they used rowing in this example too and one group did this as a low intensity rowing and the second group did this as a moderately intense uh intense exercise and then a public goods game means that you donate to some charity after or that's what i gathered even though i had not heard the term before and what they found is that once if people exercised in a group at a moderately high intensity rather than at a low intensity it increases social bonding and you can see that by that the amount of donations go up so that is quite interesting and apparently this is uh, this is a good marker for social bonding using these sorts of public goods game uh, to as outcome measures in research studies. So uh, that was news to me, but but quite interesting that when you work out together at moderately high intensity, social bonding tends to increase. But what we're uh, looking at specifically here is uh, the other way around. So does working out in a group increase performance? And their second experiment tested this. So the hypothesis was that uh, increased social cohesion, and namely synchronous movement, uh, allows athletes to perform better 
in a physically demanding anaerobic running test. So what they did was they took 25 male athletes from the Oxford University Rugby Football Club and they used a crossover design and that where the athletes did uh, did a warm up and this warm up was done in three different conditions uh, so either as an individual warm up or as a warm up together with another athlete or as a synchronous warm up together with another athlete and then after this warm up they did an anaerobic test which is commonly used in rugby which is called the EAET test I'm not familiar with that, but it, the researchers said say that it measures the ability to repeat bouts of high-intensity exercise with short recovery periods. And it consists of five sets of continuous running broken up by fixed recovery times between sets, which are dictated by the time taken to complete each set. And the entire set or test takes between four to five minutes. And what they found was that there was a statistically significant difference a reduction in time taken to complete the test between the synchronous warm-up condition uh, compared to the non-synchronous warm-up condition, but with another player doing the warm-up at the same time. There was also a difference, uh, a similar difference, although not statistically significant, uh, between the synchronous warm-up condition and the solo warm-up uh, condition. So this is not necessarily a super strong study with super clear evidence or anything. That's definitely not... Uh, not something I think we can we can take from it, but uh, but I'm just going to read the part of the conclusions from the researchers, which state that our studies offer general support for a reciprocal relationship between social bonding and group exercise. Specifically, study one found that compared to low intensity exercise, moderate intensity exercise lead to greater cooperation among participants in a public goods game a commonly used behavioral measure of social bonding. Study 2 found a relationship in the opposite direction with cues to so social bonds, uh, behavioral synchrony, leading participants to perform better on a test of exercise ability. Further research is required to substantiate claims. So yeah, I think that that is a good takeaway and I would agree with that based on what uh, the results has showed in the study. So in terms of scientific evidence, in summary, there's not a whole lot out there. And I'm sure if we go to realms beyond the sporting realm, we find more and we can extrapolate from that. I think the stronger evidence is the anecdotal evidence that most top athletes in the world are really using group training. And almost like there's almost nobody who doesn't use it, who gets to the, the top of the world in, in an endurance sport. So, so I think that's stronger, but I do think it's interesting to find out about the uh, the mechanisms behind why group training seems to work, uh, that, that is definitely uh, definitely quite interesting. Now, let's move on to discussing how and when to strategically use group training to maximize its benefits and your performance improvements. First, I should say that there's no single right answer to this question. It very much depends on the context of each individual athlete and the groups or training partners they have available to them, as well as the goal of the athlete. Uh, so you will, well, you should finish listening to this episode and then I would uh, suggest taking a little bit of a debrief with yourself, maybe sit down with pen and paper and map out what the ideal setup might look like for you, given your context. And then you just iterate from that, take an, a scientist mindset experiment and uh, and then come back and change things and see if that works better and, uh, and see where that takes you in the end. Uh, I think that in an ideal world, uh, triathletes should use group training regularly and not do all of their training alone because the benefits are that good and as i said i think the anecdotal evidence is very very strong that that it is almost essential to to reach your uh, your optimal performance level or your ultimate potential but uh, let's get into some specific tips on how and when to use group training so first uh, use group training if the accountability helps you to be consistent and uh, this is for example let's say you sometimes wake up and you just snooze and then you miss your swim well can you join a swim squad and will that stop you from doing that if so it is highly beneficial for you to do so because consistency is everything and it could be the same just having a running partner that helps you get out of bed whatever it may be if if it helps you to be consistent then it is a positive period Second, use group training as a tool to help you push some hard workouts harder than you could otherwise. We talked about this 
uh, quite a bit already and uh, the studies we looked at showed that that your pain threshold increases when training with a group compared to training individually so so it makes logical sense that you can you can push yourself harder when training in a group and anybody who has done that will know this from just experience and uh, and that is a, when when we're talking about hard workouts if you can make yourself perform better that is working harder in those workouts that is going to benefit you although of course this should be uh, accompanied by proper recovery and adequate recovery because there is going to be a cost for going hard and uh, that is going easy and allowing for recovery from that workout so that it, it's not to say that you should race every single time you go and train with a group this is again a fine balance to find but generally speaking you can you can probably find that that on average you can without increasing the the recovery that you need you can just increase your performance output a little bit for the same perception of effort that you usually have in your solo workouts if you join a group for let's say a couple of hard workouts each week so so i think there is some free gains to be made there just with without actually pushing yourself to the brink or really competing all out every single time because i don't think you should do that either even though certainly in swimming for example there is a case to be made that well you can pretty much swim uh, an, an almost all-out swim a couple of day, times per week and, and that's not going to be too detrimental for you uh, if, if at all detrimental so so it depends on the sport running is a bit different and we'll get to that in a bit but but definitely the overall takeaway i would say is that it is a great tool to be able to to push harder in hard workouts but but it needs to be done with with some uh, just with, with a little bit of common sense then the next tip is to find a balance between focusing on exactly in quotation marks the workouts or the training you need versus doing the more general but with other positive aspects like being able to push harder group training so for example let's say you're working with a coach or with a training plan and you will use a group workout to replace one of the harder workouts that you have in your training schedule then it's important to not get too hung up on feeling that well you're missing out because you're not doing the exact session you have in your plan uh, because to a degree doing just good hard work on your hard days that's what gives you 80 to 90 percent of the benefit of that workout and exactly what that workout is is of much much less importance but this is something if you have a coach this is where where you, one of the one, one example of where you can really really benefit from having a coach because you should discuss with them uh, because for example if they had planned for you to do a threshold run and you replace that with a group workout that happens to be a track workout with fast 400s on a one-off basis that doesn't matter at all or the group workout might be the better choice because you were able to do a harder workout you pushed yourself really hard but it's just that over the course of weeks or months if you repeat that then it may result in you not doing as much work on certain areas of your fitness that in this case your coach would have wanted you to do so so having a dialogue around the key training objectives you have and how group training fits into that is important and if you're self-coached you you do need to take this into account as well so have an idea of what your training objectives are and how the training works to to accomplish those objectives so let's say you do want whether you're coached or not you do want to work on your threshold on the run but the track a group that you run with always tend to do faster runs on the track which is common then maybe a good solution for you might be to run with the group every other week and every other week you do uh, you run with just one or two partners outside of the track instead and, and choose to go for a threshold run with with partners of similar ability that have similar goals to you or even a solo run also generally as you get closer to a key race you might need to be a bit more prioritize your own specific workouts a bit more over what is done in a group we already mentioned the example of preparing for an ironman you may need to start skipping your local group ride because you need to go for a longer and steadier ride rather than a shorter and more stochastic ride and uh, maybe you can get a training partner with you to do that uh, but if not then that might be a situation where you just suck it up and go on your own the next tip is to not use group training for easier workouts uh, but with a few caveats if you are really really confident in your ability to stay disciplined and really go easy enough in that group workout then sure why not 
and uh, and also you can go with a single training partner that you really trust to not go any harder than you should for those easy workouts but it really needs to be like mutually mutually agreed upon that this is an easy workout this is what we're aiming to do and then it doesn't end up being you two pushing each other and then suddenly uh, ending up in in kind of moderate or hard high intensity next be more careful and selective with group training when it comes to running compared to cycling and swimming and by that i mean running is weight bearing in nature and its risk of injury is much much higher than cycling and swimming so basically one of the benefits of group training of being able to push harder it is good and that's why we see that the top runners do train in groups as well but also maybe as amateur triathletes most of us anyway uh, we don't have that same resilience that professional runners do to to be able to do those really hard group workouts twice per week so the risk of injury can go up if you if the group allows you to push yourself maybe beyond your capabilities even if it's just your your engine allows you to do that but your chassis doesn't or your it's just mechanically too big a load for you so so you can absolutely and should do group workouts in running if you have good group workouts available to you but just be careful not to turn every run workout into a race uh, which swimming i wouldn't say that you need to be necessarily super careful with that it depends a bit on your ability to to recover of course and individuality but definitely running you need to be careful with that and run hard but sensibly and uh, and just benefit from the fact that it probably will still feel easier to run hard in a group compared to running alone but but you don't have to push that all the way to the extreme of, of actually racing the workout every single time and especially as you start doing group run workouts when you are increasing the load of your running workouts this is a period to be particularly careful and uh, yeah and this is as compared to swimming and cycling next use group training to make the sport a social outlet so uh, now again we are in the pandemic and we maybe haven't even said hi to anybody in a year uh, well probably we have but but we haven't had a lot of social outlets in some time many of us once things become a bit more normal again after a pandemic that it's logical that we will want to have some more social out- outlets but that being said 95 percent of people listening to this probably are extremely busy with with a family perhaps and with a career and with triathlon training on top of that so it's understandable that there may not be that much time for socializing outside of the context of family work and and uh, training but if you're always training on your own then then you don't have that and work let's face it you have colleagues and that's great but but it's still work so so if you can make triathlon a social outlet and uh, get to meet like-minded people then that is a great advantage i think from like a general holistic perspective of of health and the social uh, socializing being an important part of that for for human beings in general and then finally uh, realize that not all groups and training partners are created equal and if you for example join a group and you find that the sessions that they do are just bad or ineffective for your goals then don't stick with it for the sake of it find another group or find a training partner or do the work on your own an example might be that some masters swim groups are very very unspecific to triathlon swimming that's not to say that you can't benefit from them i think it depends a lot on where you are in your swimming development and people that are more towards the beginning of their swimming development might still benefit a lot from that but people that are farther along might not benefit from it so much because it's just uh yeah not very specific to to triathlon and quite quite different so but that's just one example it could be there could be a number of reasons that that a group or a training partner doesn't work out for you so realize that and uh, and don't look at it as well i'm just forcing myself to go through with a, a particular group or a particular training partner if, if it doesn't work out then just stop it find find another solution uh, so those are the tips i'm not going to give any guidelines for how many times per week or what specific sessions or what parts of the sessions or which disciplines exactly you should do as group workouts because as you can hear there are a lot of moving parts and variables so use this list these these pieces of advice and these considerations 
to formulate your own optimal schedule of how and when to use group workouts and if you have a coach of course uh, discuss this with them and uh, how how they think you can integrate group workouts into your training program so just to summarize uh, what we talked about here first group training or training with one or several training partners is highly beneficial we know this anecdotally from looking at the best practices of top athletes across endurance sports and even from some uh, albeit quite scarce scientific evidence some of the main benefits of group training are that it makes things fun motivating it gives you accountability and it helps you push harder than you might be able to otherwise and it lets you track your progress against the group but you need to find a group or or training partners where the difference in fitness level or goals uh, and goals in terms of for example ironman compared to short course racing aren't detrimental to what you're trying to achieve and try to hit that sweet spot of uh, working group training into into a context that is still okay for what you're individually trying to achieve uh, in terms of your training objectives and some key tips for getting the most out of group training include to use it for hard sessions, especially to help you push harder than you otherwise could. Be careful with the easy sessions. These are primary candidates to do on your own or with just one training partner that you trust not to push the pace. Don't be too picky thinking that you absolutely have to do one very specific session on a given day just because it says so in your program and therefore cannot do group training because there are many good sessions. So, so yours is not the only one that is the correct one. But uh, especially as you get closer to key races, you do need to pay some attention to making sure that you get some specific work done. And if that doesn't happen in the group, then maybe you will need to rely more on solo training for a period of time as you get closer to that key race. And finally, don't underestimate the added bonus of just getting social interaction through the group workouts. That's it for today's TTS Thursday. Uh, please send in questions uh, about this episode if you have any, and I will answer them next week. And uh, a couple of pieces of housekeeping as well. Before wrapping up, I want to thank everybody who applied for the coaching position at Scientific Triathlon. We had a number of great candidates and have found a new coach who is ready to start pretty much right away. So more news to follow on that soon. But uh, essentially that means that we now have a number of coaching slots available again. If you're interested in coaching, then do check out our coaching page on scientifictriathlon.com. And another great piece of news is that the advanced training plans for Olympic half and full distance are very, very close to being launched. Next week on Thursday, they should be ready to go. So I will announce them then officially. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, as usual, there will be a two-week launch period when they are available at a heavily discounted price. Uh, but that opportunity goes away after two weeks. So don't miss that if you want to get them for cheaper than the regular price. A link in the episode description to the studies that I mentioned. And don't forget that you can check out the TTS Thursday episode archive on scientifictriathlon.com. Thank you finally to our sponsors, Senate, that you can find on senatesumtrainer.com. Use the swim trainer to improve your technique, power, and stamina, even when you don't have time to go to the pool or pools are closed. And do that while practicing good core activation, thanks to the engineered instability of the swim bench and practicing a high elbow catch. Get 20% off your order on the swim trainer with the promo code that you can get on senatesumtrainer.com forward slash TTS. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, high-performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses, and get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roka.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart, and keep loving triathlon. <laughs>